another episode of JT Talks Jobs, the show that teaches you everything that school didn't when it comes to job search and career growth. And today, we are going to be talking about self-onboarding. Specifically, I'm going to give you five tips that you can use to better onboard yourself to a new job. So with um, a lot of doom and gloom in the world right now, let's call it for what it is, right? The unemployment report came out this morning. We're now over 47 million people in the US alone who have filed for unemployment in less than three months. It's kind of staggering. Lots of discussions on what the rebound will look like, how long it'll take. Is it a V curve? Is it a W curve? Is this all these crazy topics? Guess what? I'm going to break it down for you. Things will get better. It might get worse before they get better, but things will get better and companies will hire. Companies are already starting to figure it out. You know, they sat sort of in a holding pattern. Now everyone's sick of being in a holding pattern. Doesn't matter what it is, they're ready to move on and take action. And with that will come hiring. And with that will be lots of people in new jobs. And that's why we decided today to do this topic because it's going to be competitive to get a new job. So if you are lucky enough to land a brand new position, you wanna knock it out of the park. And there's really good reasons why taking ownership of your own onboarding can pay off huge for you in your career, both in the short term and the long term. So that's why we're gonna be talking about that today. Before I get started, just a friendly reminder that we at Work at Daily are so proud of the fact that during this pandemic, we are the leading provider of free resources for job search and career development. Everything from resume, cover letter, LinkedIn, what to do when you've been laid off, the mistakes that people are making in job search, you name it, interview prep, we've got it all. And we're doing that because we committed in 2020 to help over 1 million people advance their careers. So I really do hope that you take advantage of these free resources. The team's worked so hard on putting them together. We've already gotten a lot of great feedback from people that have found the free resources helpful. There's nothing like getting a message in our inbox that tells us that people landed a job. It's, it's amazing. So please, uh, we're here to serve you and to provide you with that information. And for the few of you that would like extra attention, the few of you that would like to work personally with a career coach, get that, you know, that one-on-one -on -one attention that you need to feel like you're doing everything right and that you're moving the needle, that support that you need to feel so that you're not all alone and that someone's looking out for you, well, then you need to join us at Work It Daily. And we have a three-day free trial. We're less than the money you spend on coffee at the local Dunkin' Donuts. We're less than the cost of your gym membership. And honestly, we provide 10 times the value. We may not make you look great in a bathing suit, but you know what? We're sure as heck going to make you feel really proud about what you do for a living. That is for darn sure. So if you want to feel amazing about your career, you need a coach. And we're the people to do it because we're the first and only affordable online career coaching platform that gets results. Okay. All right. Enough on that. Let's talk about onboarding. So you finally landed that new job. You're all excited. What do you do? Well, you learn to onboard yourself. Self-onboarding is a technique that everyone should learn because these days every job is temporary. You're going to have to onboard yourself multiple times in your lifetime. Even if you stay at the same company, you'll change jobs. And when you change jobs, the onboarding process starts all over again. The reason for that is that no one should ever assume that it is the employer's responsibility to teach you how to be successful in your job. That is a huge mistake. Nobody here, if anybody is guilty of doing that, I need you to eradicate that idea from your mind right now. It is not your employer's job to make you successful. They hired you. They are paying you good money. You need to think of yourself as a business of one because that is what you are. You are a service provider and your business has one full-time client. You have one client that's taking up all your needs. But as a business, you have a partnership. And it's on you to figure out what has to happen for the partnership to be a success. If you want to keep getting paid money, you have to figure out what it takes to exceed their expectations and build their loyalty and make them want to give you even more money. It's on you. Make no mistake. I say that because I've had so many people in the past come to me, get let go from a job in the first 90 days, and they're blindsided. They say, JT, it wasn't my fault. They didn't coach me. They didn't give me training. They didn't give me help. They didn't give me resources. And I say, guess what? That's on you. You need to figure out how to onboard yourself. And I'll tell you, there's an upside to that, folks, because in HR, we are taught that the first 90 days is the most telling part of how successful a person will be in the organization. In fact, 
Nowadays, many companies will write into your employment contract that in the first 90 days, at any time they can fire you without explaining why. This is because they've learned that if they see anything that doesn't look good, doesn't look right, they don't like the way you're working, they know they're not ever going to be able to fix you because you have to be able to fix you. And so they'd rather cut their losses. There's a saying in HR, hire slowly, fire quickly. That's why that's in place. So please understand that this is on you. Now, the good news is if you take ownership for this, there's a lot you can do to knock it out of the park and be so impressive because you are taking ownership that you can set yourself up for success. You know, long time ago when I was in HR, corporate HR, I saw a study at this organization. They assess their talent. Only one out of 10 people hired ever made it to management level or higher. One out of 10. So they wanted to understand why that was because they were big believers in developing talent and growing. And they were all about this growing and developing talent. They went back and they looked at all these people that ended up in management or higher. You know what they all had in common in their um, employee files? They all had comments from their managers about how strong they started, what a self-starter they were, how they hit the ground running in the first 90 days, how they produced so much value that they outshine their, their peers um, who were doing the same job or who had been there longer. It all came down to those 90 days where they formed an impression that they were something special. So I really wanted to spend time before I gave you my, my tips getting you to understand that and getting you excited about the opportunity that you have when you take ownership and you stop thinking that it's a company's job to onboard you because it is not. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this. We now know, we now agree. We're all going to raise our hand and we're going to say, it's my job to exceed the client's expectation. Raise your hand and say it out loud, folks. It is my job to exceed the client's expectation. That is the key. Once you've identified that, these tips are really going to make sense. So let's start with number one, and that is setting up good communication protocols. So what do I mean by that? Well, your boss is a unique individual. And if you've never taken our communication style quiz before at Work It Daily, you should run over there and do it. It's a free quiz, 20 questions, and it tells you which style, predominant communication style you are. You're one of four, commander, contemplator, energizer, empathizer. But as you start to study it, it's not difficult. You can pretty much figure out what your manager is, what your peers are. And this is a very important technique to do. Because when you know what communication style your boss is, you can set up communication protocols that will speak to them, that'll be the way they want. Because for some examples might be, some bosses want you to check in with them every day. They want you to come in in the morning and just tell them what they're going to be, what you're working on. And before you leave at night, they want you to tell them verbally what they got done. Some don't want to see you. They just want an update once a week. You know, they want you to set a meeting with them, answer all their questions, and you're done. Others like an email. A, you know, a Monday, this is what I'm going to do for a week. And a Friday, hey, here's what I got done for the week. Everyone's a little different. So if you know that, one of the first things you're going to do when you meet with your new boss is say, how do you like to be communicated with? How frequently do you want me to update you on what I'm working on? Do you prefer it in email? Do you prefer it by phone? What's the best way to do this so that I'm not overwhelming you, asking you too many questions, or not giving you enough information that you feel comfortable with my work? Very important that you work out your communication protocols. Same thing goes for asking questions. I can't tell you how many times I have seen somebody lose a new job because they either asked too many questions and the boss found them distracting or they didn't ask enough questions and they didn't end up doing the work properly. So what's the protocol for asking questions and who should I ask questions to? In fact, keep that in mind because tip number five is about that as well. Communication protocols. You need good communication, you need good systems for communication, and you need to adhere to those systems of communication so that they really work for the employer. Just because you like to be communicated to in one way doesn't mean that's the way your employer wants to do it, and that's what you have to understand and adapt to. All right, next one, assess all the players carefully. So this was one I learned early on in my career as well. When you start a new job, there's all different types of people. There are the people that seem to ignore you, that, that you almost think they don't like you. There are the people that come running up to you, invite you to lunch. They just seem like they want to be your best friend. And there's people all the way in between, right? There's the two extremes, the overly friendly, helpful, and the super aloof and somewhere in between. What you find out over time is that you should never make assumptions about your initial first impressions. 
raise a virtual hand if you've ever had somebody in the beginning being so nice to you only to find out they're the backstabber, sabotager of the, of the group, right? Or how about the person that you thought was super aloof and rude and it turns out they're just incredibly shy but very intelligent and so helpful and so kind to you. So you always wanna assess the players carefully. You wanna spend time getting to know people. You don't wanna make any immediate or rash judgments about individuals. It's important to know what their job is, what their roles and responsibilities are. You need to understand how their roles and responsibilities overlap or intersect with yours, meaning how does your work affect theirs and vice versa. And you wanna figure out what needs to happen for the two of you to have a good working relationship because that's gonna be different from person to person. You can't assess that in a day. That is something that you need to consciously do over those first 90 days. But not paying attention to it is detrimental. Your goal should be figuring out the communication style of each person, figuring out what they need to feel safe, to feel like they can trust you, to feel like they can collaborate with you and build a relationship with you. Once again, you're the new person on the block. They already got the job here. They're already established in the organization. Had people say to me, oh, they're all so rude. I'm the new person. They should be nice to me. It's not how it works, folks. You're all business partners. Get over it. It's your job to make friends. It's your job to prove yourself. They've already done that. You're getting paid good money. So it's on you to figure that out. See the difference? Awesome. All right, let's look at number three for onboarding. Managing expectations. This is extremely important. I've had people come to me and say, I got fired because... Um, they said I didn't give them enough notice um, that I was behind on a project. Okay. Or, you know, I got laid off or let go because um, they said that I was really high maintenance and that I was asking too many questions and I wasn't getting the work done quickly enough. Okay. So to me, those are examples of expectations not being properly managed. If you know when things need to be done, the priority of things, and that you are on top of the priorities. When you communicate that effectively, people will not be surprised. So it's on you to say, all right, what's the timeline? When is this due by? And okay, there's 10 things on my list today, right? I've got 10 things I'm supposed to work on. I clearly can only do three of them today. Which three would be deemed the most important? So this is where you're really going to need to build your communication strategy with others because you're going to need that feedback. You're going to need to be able to go to somebody and say, I have 10 things I'm juggling. There's only, I can only get three done today. Which three do you think I should do first for this organization and why? Right. And then communicate to everybody whose stuff isn't going to get done, your situation, what's going on, what you have on your plate and why, you know, you're doing these things first and their things second. The more you manage expectations, the more you minimize the chance of being misunderstood, missing deadlines, and losing trust. So again, it's on you. Don't keep it all inside. Don't try to do everything. Get help. They've been there a while. You might be overestimating the time it's going to take to do something, or maybe you're over-prioritizing something that just isn't that important. You're new. You don't know this stuff yet. So the only way to manage expectations is by talking to people and getting their feedback about what you're doing, how quickly you're doing it, what's normal, in order for you to make sure that people are comfortable with your workflow and the quality of your work. All right, number four, don't reference your ex. Oh, I cannot stress this one enough. There is nothing more annoying than when a new employee says, well, when I was at XYZ Corp, we did it this way right? Or, well, we had that happen at XYZ Corp, and that's not what we did. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It can be natural. We might not even think about it because we're comparing and contrasting. We've had a previous situation. All of a sudden, a similar type of situation is coming up in the office. It can be a knee-jerk reaction to say, oh, I've dealt with that before when I was at my other employer. Um, but you don't want to reference your ex all the time, especially if you're pointing out that they do things differently a lot of times they're gonna assume that you're criticizing the organization and you work for them now. So you never want to bring up your ex unless somebody asks. They might look at you and say, gee, Mary, you worked at XYZ Corp. What did you guys do in this situation, right? Let them bring up your ex. That's the right time to do that. Or if you're bringing up a situation, don't reference the ex explicitly. Just say, well, you know, one time in my past, 
this was the situation and this is what we did. But try to avoid talking about the ex whenever you can. And if it does come up, it's usually going to be because they ask you personally and that's when it's okay. All right? All right. And number five, this is a big one. Identify an onboarding buddy. Your boss isn't the person that's supposed to answer every single little question that you have about the company. You have a lot of little questions, whether it's about um, time off or benefits or how holidays work or lunch spots or how to fill out the time card. There's just like the little things that it's really, it's too, not the stuff that your manager should be spending time answering. Your manager should be answering the big, important strategic questions related to your work. So everyone should find an onboarding buddy. Now, again, you don't want to pick the first person that like runs up to you to be besties in the office. Give yourself, you know, a week. As you start to get to know people, you'll find somebody that you feel has a similar communication style to yours, that you feel comfortable with, um, that seems knowledgeable in the organization. And I would reach out to them and say, look, you know, I have these kind of random questions and I don't want to bother the boss. Would it be okay? Would you be my onboarding buddy? Would it be okay if I just asked you questions confidentially from time to time? I just don't want to look silly or foolish, but I do have a few questions. You'd be amazed. A lot of people are really honored when they get asked to be the buddy, right? Because it, to them, it means they, they outwardly gave you a sign of trust. And so, of course, they want to be able to help you. Some really good organizations assign you an onboarding buddy, but not all do. And so, again, it's not their job to do that for you. It's your job to do it for yourself. And I, having that onboarding buddy can help you with all of the things that I just talked about previously. They really can be your sounding board, give you feedback on how you're doing, make suggestions on what you can do to manage expectations better, right? To set up communication protocols that work, all the different things. So, that is probably one of the best tips that I can give you when it comes to onboarding. All right. So there you have it. Those are my five tips or hacks for really self onboarding yourself. But a lot of you might be thinking, all right, well, that's a great overview. I can run with that. And others might be thinking, hmm, I might need a little more. And that's a good reason. Because as I said, the first 90 days determines how successful you'll be. So if you're somebody that's going GJT, I think I'd feel a lot better if I had a checklist. If I had a day-by-day -day game plan over the first 90 days that covered all the things that you talked about and told me the tactics I should use to do those things. So if that's something that sounds appealing to you, I got good news, folks. That's exactly what we offer at Work It Daily. If you want a step-by-step, day-by-day, first 90-day onboarding program to help make sure you lay a solid foundation so that you can be one of those top people that has longer tenure at the company and maybe even moves up in management, then you need to come join us because we actually have a course called the first 90 days, the step-by-step -step guide to onboarding. There's videos for every single day. There's templates and tutorials to support you. And oh, by the way, there's career coaches who work with you one-on-one. -on -one. So as you're new in the job and things come up, you message the coaches so that they can be your buddy and help you make sure you're doing the right things. Not to mention there's Lots of other new employees inside the Work It Daily platform so that you can be a sounding board and say, has anybody else got this going on at their company? And then you can get some more added perspective so that you don't feel all alone. So if that sounds of interest to you, invest in yourself. Come join us at Work It Daily because you spent a lot of time and energy landing this job. This job is worth thousands and thousands of dollars for you. So if you care about really being successful and you get in there and you can tell there's no onboarding, what did you learn today? It's not their job, it's your job. Why not invest a very small amount, mind you, to make sure that you've got a step-by-step -step plan to be successful. I can't even tell you how many members of Work A Daily, first we help them get their job, and then when they get their job, they use the first 90 days to crush it in their job and set themselves up for a promotion. And we hear all the time, how they've said their managers comment on, you're just doing such a nice job. I love how you're managing us, right? You're managing up. That's what people are looking for, okay? All right, great. Well, I hope you found that helpful. I've left lots of time today for questions. I wanted to make sure that we could do a good and robust general Q&A session. So if you've got questions about onboarding, I'm gonna take them now. I'll also have time today to take some general questions regarding job search or any other aspects of career planning that you have, okay? All right, my friends, let me jump on over there to the questions and see what we've got going on here today. So the first question over on LinkedIn from Hema, assessing um, that it's hard when you virtually onboard, any suggestions? Okay, so the question is, how did you virtual onboarding? So I love this question. When, you're, when you are remote, 
there's not a lot of face-to-face -face time throughout the day. So in our case, with our first 90 days, we tell you to set structured meetings around it and say, this is the agenda. These are the things. So you would, for example, keep a running list of all the questions that you have as you start in a new company. We all do, right? You know how you start a job and all these little thoughts pop in your head? I wonder about this. I wonder about that. You write them all down. You then organize those thoughts by category. Are these questions about HR and employment? Are these questions about my job? Is this questions about my manager? And you organize them. And then you set meetings accordingly. You reach out and you say, you know what? Can I get 15 minutes on your calendar? I have six questions regarding this. And some people might say, well, just message me the six questions and I'll answer them for you. Or they'll set a call. But that's why I want you to structure it first and get a collective list going because what they don't have time to do is, is have you, you know, call them every two seconds with a single question. So that's why you have to do a little bit more planning and organization, but definitely set those up and get those questions answered in that consistent fashion because you have got to build that relationship and close that loop with your employer. When you're not face to face, it's on you to make sure that you create as much of a connection as possible. All right, over on YouTube, I've got a question from CC Music Fan. Oh, I love the name. What is the strategy with a startup company, brand new sales team, selling a new product, and even corporate learning the best strategy? Oh, I love this question. Startups are notorious for having absolutely zero onboarding. They're startups. They, their definition of onboarding is you starting rolling up your sleeve and just doing things. So I'll tell you one thing that you can do for your startup that will score mega points. When you start with the company, document what you did every day. So at the end of each day, carve out like 15 minutes to sit down and figure out, write up in a document what you did. At the end of the week, look at what you did all week long and try to categorize it into major learnings. What were the major aha moments or major skill sets that you learned or developed over that week? Do it again and map that out over 90 days. What will happen is that you will essentially have built the custom onboarding program for your company. I would also tell you, if you join us, you can use our 90-day onboarding program as your foundational guide and then tailor the results to what you're doing in your company. So when you're done, you can say, you know what, in my first 90 days here in the startup, I followed this plan and I realized that people need to learn this and this and this and this and we need to have processes for this and this and this. They will love you for that because there's no one there to do it in the startup. And in the startup world, you never, ever say that's not my job. People that say that's not my job don't get hired in startup. It's everyone's job in startup. We all have to pitch in. So why wouldn't you, if you want to onboard correctly, own it. Own the onboarding process. I will tell you, you will score major points for that, especially with sales. Marsha over on LinkedIn asks, how do you identify an onboarding buddy when you are a new remote employee? I love that question. So Marsha, you know what I would do? Again, give yourself a week and see who your peers are. And then identify maybe two or three people that you would really like to be your buddy based on your interactions with them. You felt like they were easier to talk to, um, that they're, you know, they've been there long enough. And then go to your boss when you have your weekly meeting with your boss and say to your boss, you know, this might sound silly, but I was thinking it would be really helpful if I had an onboarding buddy or if I had a point of contact, a peer point of contact, if you don't want to use the word buddy, if I had a peer point of contact, because there are a lot of little questions that I have, and I just don't want to bother you as the manager. And plus, it would be a nice way for me to make a friend and to develop a relationship with somebody since I'm virtual. So you're giving the manager two reasons. One, you're going to save the manager from getting a lot of, of your questions. And two, it lets you build a relationship. These are both valid reasons to have this. And say to your boss, you know, I've so far I've been interacting with a bunch of people and I was thinking of maybe asking so-and-so or so-and-so, you know, give them two or three people. Do you have a preference? Do you, do you think any of them would be worthy of a peer? Um, would you be comfortable with them? And, and how do you feel about me doing that? What will happen is the manager will tend to gravitate towards who they really want you to learn from. So they might say, oh yeah, ask Mike or ask Jill. Or they might say, you know, actually none of the, I don't want you to do that with any of those. Let me pick one out for you. And then they'll go ahead and assign you one. But being proactive like that is the best way to do it. And going in with a couple of suggestions is even easier for the, for the manager. So that's my advice. But absolutely do it because as a remote employee, you really need one. 
Uh, okay, over on YouTube, Mary is asking, what if they hire you for your experience at other companies in order to help mature their processes? Is there a limit to how to reference your experience or validate your recommendations? Oh, Mary, smart, smart question, milady. Very smart. So um, when you get hired because of your expertise at another company, you want to be super careful because basically you're being brought in to be the quote unquote golden child. And studies by consulting firms show that a lot of times that doesn't work out because your experience at the old company was only one of the reasons why you were successful there. The other two reasons were your relationships. You had built up your relationships. So you built up a lot of trust. So people would go ahead and do things uh, the way you told them to because they trusted you, right? They wouldn't question your decisions. And your aptitude, meaning the way you did things, a lot of people trusted, the way you executed work. When you go to a new company, all they know is your experience, but they are not going to readily trust you from a relationship standpoint or from an aptitude standpoint. They're going to want to see how you operate. So know that you're not going to be able to move the needle as quickly as you could have at your previous, because those were things that you built up over time, right? So man, this is you managing your expectations and you need to manage their expectations around that. So what I think you always want to do in those situations is say, I'm going to walk you through how we did it at the old place. I'm going to tell you the pros and cons. And I'm also going to tell you that I think we want to think our own situation through and decide what we think is best for my previous experience, but also tailor it and make it our own so that it works with how our, this culture works. So by pointing that fact out to them, by helping them understand that while you bring this experience, you know that it was tailored to their environment and that you would never 100% assume that that experience would work here and that you really want to make an effort to assess and, and incorporate everybody's ideas and feedback and thoughts so that we can make an even better version. Does that make sense? Because if you just go in, and I think this is why you were asking and say, well, this is how we did it and this is how we're going to do it, you're going to be met with a lot of resistance. But if you go in and say, and say, well, here's how we did it. Now as a group, let's talk about how we can take some of this and adapt it and make it our own here using our own abilities and our own strengths. What do you all think? What are you thinking about the ideas? And soliciting that feedback because you're going to have to gain that trust. It's not automatic. And if you do that, you'll be just fine. Uh, okay, Devora asks, um, is the course good for someone who started six weeks ago? Sure. If you started six weeks ago and you don't feel like you're onboarding successfully, Devora, I would absolutely grab the class and start to go through and see what's missing. I guarantee you, you're going to look at the 90 day plan and go, oh my gosh, uh, out of like the first 20 steps, I've only done 10 of them. And then you can go back and fix what you missed. Uh, Elisa on YouTube is asking, my manager mentions that I'm doing a good job, but it seems I'm not getting enough responsibilities. What should I do? I spoke to my manager, but he says he needs me and my job is secure. <laughs> That's so great. I love that. Yeah, Elisa, it means you're super intelligent and you want to take on more work and they're just not ready for that yet. A lot of times in these situations, the reason the manager isn't giving you more responsibility is because in their mind, there's going to be more training and coaching to do and they don't have the time to do it. So the thing I'll tell you right now is continue to crush the job. Do such a good job that you get everything done. And then my guess is that you probably have time on your hands or you wouldn't be asking, right? Probably have time on your hands. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look. You're smart. You're observing. I want you to look at your boss and the things that are taking up most of your boss's time. The real headaches. When you hear your boss complaining about something, um, having to deal with a lot of stuff. And then I want you to ask yourself, what would I be able to do to take some of that off my boss's plate? How could I make my boss's life easier? Because when you just say, what else can I do? Your boss can't think of anything. But when you go to your boss and say, you know, I've noticed that you're always stuck having to do this particular activity and that it takes you a lot of time and it's really taking you away from doing more strategic work for the company. I'm wondering if that's not something that I could help you with. Because I've been doing my research and I think that I could do this, this, and this for you. My point is, you want to go in and not only point out a stressor that they have, but the fact that you've already researched a way to take it off their plate. <clears throat> if you want somebody to give you more responsibility, not only do you have to be specific in what you ask for in terms of responsibility, you have to start to convince them that you've already figured out how to do it 
So it's not going to be a total nightmare or headache for them to, to teach you. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's what I mean about exceeding expectations. And the fact that you asked that already shows me that you are a rock star, by the way. You are a rock star, which is why your boss keeps telling you you're doing a great job, but you can still do an even better job. Take a headache. You will be absolutely indispensable if you can take some headaches off your boss's plate and figure out how to do them on your own. Okay? <clears throat> Good question, by the way. Okay, over on YouTube, we've got the question from Kia. I recently joined a professional service firm. Most of the team members do not have client projects to do. This might be the trend for the first 90 days. That actually is very often the case. What's my best way to show my capabilities and contributions? I love it. So when you don't have projects in the first 90 days, it's a really amazing opportunity for you to research some of the past projects and get to know some of the key players in the organization. So if, if that was my situation, I would be doing a ton of informational interviewing. I would be asking all sorts of people who have been at the organization and have done projects um, if they have time for coffee, if they would be willing to meet with you for 20 minutes, and I would interview the heck out of them. What was their first project like? How do they think uh, how do you, they think it's important to exceed expectations in the organization? What, it, what do they think success looks like? You really want to get an understanding. You will learn so much from the established consulting members if you can spend time with them. The other thing is by doing that and asking them for their, in, their insights, you're building up rapport. And it's very possible that in doing so, they will get to know you and ask you questions about your skills and experience. And when they're deciding who gets assigned to projects, they'll fight for you. And they'll say, you know what? I actually have something that you know so-and-so can work on. I'm gonna grab him or her. So you wanna do that informational interviewing, that networking internally as much as you possibly can. But it's really informational interviewing. It's you interviewing them and giving them a chance to share their expertise as a way for you to build a relationship. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, Razi over on LinkedIn is asking, how can we onboard with two merger, merged rather acquisition companies? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, so what do you do when two companies have merged? So first thing you wanna do is figure out which one's the dominant. There will always be a dominant company. It's always one company eating another. I don't know why they, <laughs> they call it merger, uh, but it's really acquire. It's always an acquire. It's always one eating the other one. And it's interesting because it doesn't, that doesn't mean that the bigger company is the acquirer. I actually, years ago in my life, a um, big company acquired the small regional company that I was a VP for. And I was on maternity leave at the time. And I remember when I, they asked me to come in to meet the new company that bought us, I just assumed I was gonna be let go, that you know, the big major acquirer, they were just gonna get rid of me because I was smaller, only to find out that they were intending to keep me and get rid of the other people. And so it was, it was really a shocker to me. So you need to figure out who's acquiring who, and then which processes they're going to keep and which ones they're gonna jet. And that can be hard to figure out. So there's a lot of observing, a lot of interviewing, a lot of networking, as you start to sort out who is bubbling to the top as the leaders of the organization. And then once you see that, you're going to know how to build your onboarding, your support, your communication strategy. The 90 days still apply in our first 90 days. Every single thing in that checklist still applies even through the merger. The only difference is, is when you're looking at the key leaders, you're paying attention to who's bubbling to the top in that situation. Great question. Why you guys are on fire today? Jacqueline over on YouTube is asking, how can you onboard without committing or offending the greeter? I don't want to get stuck with one person who without knowing the full environment can unknowingly categorize with the boss's pet. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> so what Jacqueline is asking is, what do you do when you have that person that's like really overwhelming and they just, they want to be your bestie and they want to support you, but you can just tell by the dynamics in the organization that this person probably isn't the best person for you to partner with, right? Well, here's my experience. In the beginning, be super polite. Be very respectful because they are reaching out to you, they're greeting you, they're supporting you. But also follow the plan of establishing relationships with everybody. And if this person inquires about it, you can simply say, you know, in my past experience, I've learned it's really important that I develop relationships with everybody in the organization so that we can be a true team. And I'm so grateful for all the support you've given me. I also think that I need to spend some time with this person and this person and really diversify to make sure that all my relationships are solid 
so that you know people feel comfortable working with me. So there's a valid reason for you to give to them, for you to want to work with other individuals. But be respectful of it. What happens over time is, remember, onboarding doesn't last forever. Over time, you fall into your groove with your relationships, and that person, that greeter, sort of falls off, or the situation mellows out because you're busy. You're busy. You're in your role. You're doing your job, and you're establishing relationships with other people. I just wouldn't too quickly jump to distance yourself. You don't need to. You don't need to to try to sever anything. You just need to let it play out. All right. Okay, James over on YouTube. What do you do when your manager ignores you? <laughs> That's, oh my gosh. I'm not I shouldn't be laughing, manager. It's just that I've had that situation, James. So let me just back up and say why I'm laughing is because I've been there. I remember taking this job. I was very, very young at the time. I was so excited. And when I say literally, the boss wouldn't even make eye contact with me. He would walk straight to his office. He'd close the door. I couldn't get at him. I couldn't get on his calendar. It was absolutely exhausting and scary and horrifying. So <laughs> you're bringing back memories. Those are like scary laughs, not, not happy laughs. Um, but the simple answer is this. You have to assume your manager's not out of the equation. Do not throw your hands up in the air. This is when you go find somebody who is either doing close work with your manager or who has successfully navigated the process. So I went and found somebody that had worked for this person for 10 years. I was like, all right, this person's obviously figured out how to stick around. This person figured out how to work with this manager for 10 years. Literally sat the person down and said, I want to succeed here. I can't get him to talk to me. He won't even look at me in the morning. Did I do something wrong? And the person's like, gosh, no, absolutely not. He's super antisocial. He just wants you to do your work. Like fabulous. Walk me through how to do that to impress him. I got the total communication blueprint from this person. I also got an amazing buddy in the process. Became a great colleague and a great friend. And later on, when I left and went to a new job, I was able to help that person get a job. So it was pretty cool. So that's all. If, if your manager's not talking to you, figure out somebody that's successful with that manager and use them. They will help you fill out all 90 days. They will help you build out the things that you need to, and you'll make a great friend in the process. Okay, Billy is asking over on YouTube, the COVID cases that here in AZ are increasing in Arizona. In April, numerous potential employers were interested in moving forward, but since anything has gone, crickets, advice. I know, Billy, I'm so sorry. I mean, we're seeing it in so many states, the surge. And the reality is, is it's just companies haven't figured it out yet. Some companies sat in limbo for a really long time, and now they're they're taking action. They're done sitting in limbo. They're going to figure it out. They're going to assume this is the new normal. They're going to figure it out. Other businesses didn't. They stayed in limbo, and now these things are hitting, and they don't know what to do. It is unprecedented times. It's such a crummy word because it's been used so many times, unprecedented. But it's true. It's, it is what it is. We've just never seen this before. I wish I could tell you there was some secret hack to get them to respond, but they can't. They can't do something they're not ready to do. They just can't. So my advice is you keep looking and you keep expanding your opportunities because a bunch of those opportunities will die. They won't be in, in place anymore. It's unfortunate, but it's true. I would look for who's hiring right now. Absolutely. Just focus forward. Look for the opportunities going forward. If things turn around and if those companies come back, they will notify you. They will reach out to you. But I wouldn't sit back and wait. I wouldn't say, well, I'm just going to wait till those six opportunities pan out. I'd start looking for new ones. Echoes for anyone listening to this right now. There are so many companies that are hiring one day and all of a sudden the next day they get financial numbers and they have to halt everything. It's, it's happening daily, right? I mean, the, the layoff numbers that are coming through my desk, Macy's is laying off thousands of people this week. Um, I just, I, not tons of people at corporate headquarters now, right? So companies did layoffs, but now they're doing their second rounds of layoffs, their second rounds of restructuring. Companies that didn't lay off because they got the PPP, the payroll protection program, and you couldn't lay off or the, the debt wasn't forgiven, well, that's over now. So now they're going to lay off because in that time that they were given, they couldn't fix things. So I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but I just, I need you all to hear that so that it motivates you to go find new opportunities because while there's lots of companies that are stagnant or going backwards, there are ones that are going forwards. There are one, I've got people every day in work at daily letting me know they're getting offers. I've got somebody right now, two multiple offers, competing offers. So there are companies hiring, but it's not gonna happen if you don't get out there and look for them, okay? All right, Tony over on YouTube says, my question is, how do I find what I want to do as a career? I took the career quiz in Work It Daily and the communication quiz as well, 
It said that my top two fields that suit me are coach and recruiter. <laughs> That's interesting. So, you know, the first step in the process of figuring out a career that works for you is in fact self-assessment. And it is why we push so many people to take the communication quiz and the career decoder quiz. Um, I then push a lot of people, if you work inside Work It Daily, we have you. We have this uh, professional strengths program that you take. And one thing I have people do is the career interest game, which is developed by Dr. John Holland, that can give you some ideas of some career paths. But even then, you haven't done those jobs, you don't know. My next piece of advice for you, for example, Tony, if they're saying it's coach or recruiter, you need to, inform you need to informational interview with some recruiters and some coaches. You need to grab 20 minutes of their time and say, tell me about your work. Tell me about what you like about it. Tell me about what you don't like about it. Tell me the kind of person you think that's successful at it. Tell me um, how, based on what you know about me, what, what do you think I should be concerned about, right? You really want to hear from people firsthand. They'll tell you, you know, anybody in a profession will tell you what you need to know about that sort of thing. Um, I got asked just this morning, I do live office hours, so sort of what we're doing here now, I do this live just for the members of Work It Daily on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. And somebody asked today, you know, it's my passion to be a coach, JT, can I do it full time? And my full blunt answer was no, nobody can start being a coach full time. It's not physically possible. Not in my experience. Go find a coach that could and find, learn from them. But you're never going to learn that from me because it didn't, it's not how it worked for me. I couldn't do it. And every coach I've ever seen has never been able to be a coach full time. They've had to work their way into the job. So you know what I'm saying? That's why informational interviewing will start to close the gaps in knowledge and help you figure out, are you excited about the job or not? And that's really the next step. Because once you light a fire and find a job that gets you excited and you talk to a few people and you go, oh, I like what they're saying, then it'll fall into place for you. Okay, Veronica on YouTube is asking, how many hours should we devote every day to job search and networking? After being laid off in the end of May due, due to COVID-19, quality over quantity, I find it challenging to structure my days. Oh, I love this question, Veronica. So this has a lot of moving parts to it. There's a lot of factors to how you determine how many hours you should work on your job search. First thing I'm gonna tell everyone to do is decide right now, are you a morning, afternoon, or evening person? When is your peak level of productivity? Is it first thing in the morning? Is that when your brain's the clearest? Do you kick in in the middle of the day? Or are you a night owl? Whatever it is, that's the time block in which you are going to work on your job search. Because to get the most out of your job search, you have to do it in a time when you're the most alert, okay? Then you have to ask yourself, and this is something that you either know about yourself or you might have to practice to figure out, what is your attention span? Some people can sit and do a project for 30 minutes. Some do an hour. Studies show that most people can't work for a stretch of more than two hours at a time without a break. So figure out what your block is. And then my advice to you <clears throat> is to figure out how many blocks you can fit in a four-hour period in your peak time zone. So for example, I'm a morning person. I do my best work between eight and noon. Absolutely my best work. So any work that takes a lot of thought and a lot of time, I'm going to do between 8 and 12. And I also know that I'm really good in about an hour block at a time. So you're going to see me block out a project from 8 to 9, then step away, take a break, come back, right? D you know, do some stuff just to break it up, go back 15 minutes later, maybe 9.15 to 10.15, take a break at 10.30, 10.30 to 11.30, and then finish up my day, Right? So I'm probably going to get three decent blocks in in a morning. That's what I know. And that's what I do. And that's what I would do with job search. If I was actively looking for a job right now, and I would, for each of those blocks, I would, the day before, map out exactly what I wanted to accomplish in those blocks so that when I'm sitting down in that time zone, I know what I'm working on. I'm not trying to figure it out. Then I'm going to tell you, do you do it every day? That's up to you. I don't think you have to do it every day, maybe because that's your that's your really most important time. I would tell you you're probably going to do it at least three days a week in order to, to, to do that, right? You know, probably like at least Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or maybe you are comfortable doing it Monday through Friday because it's only those short blocks in your peak time. Um, it's totally up to you, but you know what you have to get done. You know when you're at your brightest and you know what, how long your attention span lasts for. Factor those in and then work it accordingly. Because it is not an eight hour a day job. It is not a 40 hour a week thing. It can be done quite efficiently um, in the right amount of time. But it's a little bit different for each person, okay? 
Awesome. Wow. So listen, folks, I hope today's discussion on onboarding really inspired you because whether you just got a new job or you're actively looking right now, you will be in a new job. You've learned a valuable lesson. It's on you. It is your responsibility to onboard yourself and got lots of tips and tricks today. I can't stress it enough. You can join Work It Daily. We've got a three free day trial going on right now. You can join for free for three days. You can go in, check out the 90 day onboarding plan, see how amazing it is, work with our coaches and just you know get that edge because you're worth it. Do you really wanna waste it? It was already hard enough to look for a job. It's such a humbling experience looking for work and interviewing. Now you get this job, do you really wanna risk it? You don't wanna risk it. So take onboarding into your own hands, whether you work with us at Work It Daily or someplace else, just make sure you do it. All right. Awesome. All right, folks. Thank you again for stopping by. Don't forget free resources over at Work It Daily. If you need help in any aspect of your job search, we've got a resource for you. So please come check us out. And until next time, remember, if you want to win, you've got to work it daily. So stay with it. Have a great rest of the week and I will see you next time. Okay. All right, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you again.